Greetings, geologists, to mass wasting. You're seeing a sign that says, watch for falling rocks, which is in essence what the entire unit is about. But my emphasis of everything you're going to learn about in mass wasting is to be thinking about warning signs and why they're there, because it's not that it may happen, it's that it has happened. Those signs are there for a reason. Best management practices such as this retaining wall and fence are simply there to try to help protect human health and the environment from any kind of rock slides or rock falls. There's signage everywhere that says landslide area. And I'm just going to kind of show you this is there to try to keep it out of the highway as much as possible. If you kind of look at the base, you're going to notice some rock clutter where it actually still has already fallen down. I can find it here for you. There it is. But that should be on a much larger scale. And this is just a small slope here. These are all over the place to try and help reduce the potential for mass wasting. So mass wasting is the movement of downhill of any kind of material that's earthen. And it's a direct influence of gravity. A number of factors affect what, how fast, how slow, the type of mass wasting that can occur. So when you're taking a look at mass wasting, it occurs when the steepest angle that rock material can withhold is exceeded. And when that happens, we call that the angle of repose. So the angle of repose must be exceeded. You can imagine holding a bench press bar and it's as much as you can hold up and press and then one ounce gets put on that, it's too much and it comes crashing down. That would be exceeding the angle of repose. Mass wasting is going to be very common where you have steep slopes like along mountain ranges of the Appalachian Mobile Belt, Cordilleran Belt, all the way through the Rockies and Cordilleran, and anywhere that has mountains or shorelines for that matter. So you might go, what's up with this? Well, we actually have hill country right here in Texas. That's why we're prone to mass wasting. So a couple of factors that influence mass wasting. Obviously, climate does. The more humid the area the more potential for uh, degradation of rock, both by physical and chemical weathering. Water content is a huge component of mass wasting, especially soils and, and rocks types that have very fine grained sediments that actually hold water and don't penetrate water well, like clays. So if you have a slope and the weight of that slope is uh, filled with water, you have a chance for it to be overburdened and that weight can cause mass wasting to occur. You look at this picture in Olympic National Park and you can see where mass wasting has occurred on land uh, based on landslides there and that more is likely to happen because there's no vegetative cover. So when you remove vegetation either naturally or man induced because of construction, you run the risk of higher uh, potential for mass wasting. So when you analyze these two photos right here, which one do you think is at greater risk when you're thinking about vegetation? Is it the left or the right? And you're like, it's a no-brainer, Professor. Definitely the left because it's missing that vegetation, right? But this one is still having mass wasting. It's just a different kind. It's probably going to take longer to end up looking like that. So some factors that can influence mass wasting is overloading. This is actually in Christchurch, uh, New Zealand on the South Island after a couple of years actually after they had a 6.3 earthquake on the Richter scale. You've actually seen this uh, particular area in one of your prior lectures and videos. But this amount of weight that's on this hillside can't be supported anymore and so now the structures are causing overloading. They just weigh too much for the angle of repose to be held up. So when I was in uh, Glacier National Park, I caught these uh, young students, college students and high school students uh, wandering out onto the river basin and I was doing a video, I am not joking you, a video over river erosion <laughs> and, uh, and mass wasting and I was just talking about this particular area when they went and stood right on top of this thing right here. It was amazing to me that the roots actually held all four of them up for as long as they were standing there.
but that would be a good example of exceeding the angle of, of repose and mass wasting occur. That's exactly what's caused this tree to fall over. It's too much weight there, whether it be from people, from the tree, from uh, water and a combination thereof. Nevertheless, mass wasting can happen anywhere. Obviously, geology and the slope of which that geology is made up of is very important. I took this picture on my sabbatical along the um, Columbia River Gorge, which is a big river. It was really exciting, and there was a number of uh, landslide locations on that. This was one of them right here where a whole big section had landslided out. So when the slope and the dip of the rock are in the same direction, you have a higher probability of tumbling down of land and earth and material, which is exactly what you're seeing right here. So triggering mechanisms can definitely cause mass wasting. And those, uh, something like an earthquake, like we see in Christchurch right here, uh, definitely influence mass wasting to occur. Sometimes mass wasting is very slow and it's not from triggering mechanisms, but in some cases it's very fast. This is an example of fast mass wasting uh, where you get a rock slide and the rate of movement is going to be based on the slope, the type of rock, where it's located, is it humid, is it dry, a number of factors actually fall into that category. This particular rock slide occurred in Zion National Park, luckily in the nighttime hours when nobody was at the ranger station. So let's talk about the fastest type of rock uh, or the fastest type of mass wasting is either a rock fall or a rock slide and you can put them in the same category there. A rock fall is typically where rocks actually fall from a high place and just topple over and this particular rubble right here, this slid off but some of these rocks along the side actually were rock falls that fell off from the top. So a rock fall would actually need to be kind of hanging up at the top like these rocks right here and they could literally just fall off. So here are some rocks that had fallen off right on the edge of this picture and that's why this big gigantic retaining wall has been put there with rock bolts to bo bolt it in. This is right along Mount St. Helens Drive up to Johnston Ridge Observatory. And uh, I thought this was very interesting because this stuff is an accident waiting to happen. So slides and slumps are another type of mass wasting. This is Zion National Park, and this is Brad Turner's picture. It's just one of my favorite shots of Zion that he's ever taken. It's just beautiful, and you get a look at that Navajo you learned about in Eolian. But let's talk about slumps and, and slides, because this picture in Zion would more likely contain a slide as opposed to a slump. Is the rock slide, and which one is the rock slump? Obviously the one on the left is the slide, because you see that nice flat planar surface right in here. And then this would be where a slump occurred, and eventually this stuff will break open and fall into the highway. We have a number of those types of situations that have occurred in our Central Texas region. So we are more prone to slumps. Having said that, some slides along the river walk that goes between Cameron Park and the college. So here's what it looks like after a slide. You get a nice talus slope down here, but you can see where all that rock just slid right off. If it was a rock fall, it would be like this rock plunk fell off right here. This was probably a rock fall right there. So there's another type of mass wasting called flows. Flows are different from falls and slides because they actually move as a material through the path of least resistance. At least this type of flow does. This is a mud flow. There's a different one that doesn't follow the path of least resistance. So the thickness or viscosity of the material makes a difference how fast or slow it moves. Mount St. Helens was inundated by a mud flow known as a lahar in the 1980 Mount St. Helens volcanic eruption. For test purposes, uh, a mud flow consists of 50% silt and clay particles and at least, and the key word is at least, 30% of water. That number can go up as high as 50%. So the more water you have, the more fluidy the mud flow will be. Obviously, the less water, the more viscous it would be. But mud flows usually follow the path of least resistance like a river, or a road, some kind of conveyance system. However, debris flow is the second type of flow, and this is, contains larger particles with less water. So it moves more slow and it fans and spreads out. It is possible for a mud flow to turn into a debris flow, 
but debris flows tend to last for decades and continue their movement slowly, imperceptibly, once they have come to a flat area like you see right here. This is a recent mass wasting event in Washington State where uh, in March of 2014 a big landslide occurred and you're familiar with this. You saw the news stuff and we actually covered some of this in uh, Fluvial and it dammed up a river there and that's a devastating consequence that can happen where we have a, a very rapid mass wasting event. That's another aerial shot of that same uh, mudslide and landslide that occurred and you can totally see how the whole thing just buried in this river and dammed it up. So it is believed that the river undercut this slope and it finally gave way. In other words, it exceeded the angle of, drum roll, repose. And then when they received, received about seven inches of rain in previous weeks, that was just too much weight for the uh, slope to handle and it gave way creating a catastrophic very fast moving landslide event. So you look at that it was devastating you saw the depth toll and the that cleanup that they had to do this was a very scary thing so any type of slope that's very steep like that this kind of event can occur so we're not exempt in Waco Texas even though we don't tend to have very steep hillsides except along Cameron Park Quick clays are another type of flow. This is a very devastating type of mass wasting, typically done and experienced when you have rapid shaking of the ground because of an earthquake. And what happens is liquefaction of clay particles. The clay cohesion separates with the shaking and the water acts as almost a lubricant and they slip. And what ends up happening is perfectly good clay-based ground turns to soup. And that means foundations and buildings that are sitting on top of that can actually catastrophically fail, which is otherwise known as ground failure in an earthquake. We talked about that in your earthquake lesson. Here's an example of quick clays or liquefaction that occurred in Christchurch in New Zealand in their 6.3 earthquake that hit downtown. This is another shot from Christchurch. This is out of their museum, by the way showing you how uh, the water came up from groundwater and just everything toppled over, whether it be the light post, the building structures, even a little mailbox right here uh, got lost. So we try to recognize and minimize the potential for mass wasting as geologists uh, and engineers for that matter. To, we want to reduce the potential for people to die and property to be lost. So there's something that's implemented called best management practices. And best management practices can be retaining walls, they can be something as simple as hay bales, they can be things like rock berms, they can be rock bolts or the wall that you saw bolted in at Mount St. Helens. Whatever it is, it is a design and put there for an intentional reason to help produce, uh, or should I say, reduce the chance for uh, a risk to human health. We want to produce safety. That's our goal with best management practices. So let's get into another type of flow, a much slower type of flow called an earth flow. An earth flow slumps from a part of a hillside right up here and it comes down underneath the soil cover or vegetative cover and then slumps out like you see this part right here. This is what we have in Waco. A lot of it to be exact. You'll be having a geology moment of the day about the earth flow along uh, that particular drive. But the earth flow, you need to have some humidity in order to make this happen. This particular earth flow is in Iceland, and there's a lot of earth flows, especially in areas that have um, glaciers nearby. So this is the mass wasting event along Lakeshore Drive right in here. And I'll give you that video, uh, you'll see it shortly, not in this lecture, but you'll see it before the lecture. Another type of mass wasting flow is called solid fluxion. And solid fluxion must be test question in a permafrost region. So permafrost regions really limit that happening in central Texas, but you could definitely see this in Alaska or Iceland. You could see this anywhere on a mountain where there's permafrost in the region. So permafrost is the key area, and you can see it looks a lot like dozens and dozens of earth flows, very similar to that, 
but it's because of the melting of the permafrost. Creep is the last type of flow that we're going to look at, and it's a great indicator a creep is in the neighborhood. And it's a geology creep, not a human creep. But you can see that these trees are bending, and the reason they are is they're bending as the soil's going down and the rock underneath it because of movement deep in the earth. The trees or roots are bending to try to compensate to get sunlight. And so bent tree roots or leaning pole lines or cemetery markers that are at an angle or turned, fence lines that are off kilter, those are all good indicators that a creep is in the neighborhood. This is extremely slow. You'd have to stand there a very long time for years probably to even have a perceptible notice but they are absolutely devastating in terms of dollars uh, to our property. And so we care about creeps for that reason. So when you look at some of the best management practices, here is a wire fence, like a retaining wall that's been put onto a steep slope, mainly to keep the rocks in from falling in the road. But you're gonna have to maintain this if rocks get loose and put pressure on this, even though it's bolted to the, to the rock, eventually it will fall apart. And so every best management practice needs to be maintained. Here's that retaining wall again in Mount St. Helens with the rock bolts. Here's a retaining wall that I saw in Australia at a zoo. And uh, right up here were where the uh, orangutans and the uh, apes were, and they were washing those animals. And I would suspect that you can see kind of a gouge here where the water was running off. They put this here to kind of minimize any soil or sediment that could get into the walkway that could pose a safety hazard for their visitors. So this is actually a rock wall, a retaining wall, instead of one just being made out of wire itself, they actually put a barrier there to slow down the flow of water. So along Highway 6, specifically Loop 340, that connects um, Highway 6 from the Riesel side all the way to I-35 crossing over Robinson, was under construction for about a decade and a half. In doing so, they had to put in a number of best management practices such as this right here, which you might have just thought is a highway uh, visual aid. It is actually a best management track practice for mass wasting. So let's look and see how they stabilize the, uh, the slope out there on Loop 340 over a period of months once they got it actually built. This is geotextile material that's impregnated with seeds to help this grow long term. This stuff has not been covered, so if it were to rain, this stuff would get into the roadway much faster. Up close, this is what that geotextile material fabric looks like, and over time we want it to grow vegetation. So you can see vegetation's not really growing in this picture once the entire area has been stabilized with this fabric material. However, several months down the line, look at what happens. You get vegetation growing. Our intent is to get this growing over at least 70% of it, and that applies to stormwater regulations, if you're wondering where that 70% magic number comes from, so they can quit having to worry about best management practices in the area. So over a course of about several years, they finally got the entire thing growing, and they put in a retaining wall for creeps and for earth flows so they wouldn't get into this busy highway and lead to accidents happening in Waco, Texas. So a few more facts about mass wasting and we'll call it a day. Landslides happen all over the world and unfortunately every state is prone to it in some shape, fashion, or common. Whether it's ground failure, it's creeps, it's earth flows, it's rock slides, mass wasting in the forms of lahars, but one thing that we know of is that landslides claim at least 600 lives annually across the world. This is a big landslide site around the Columbia River Gorge. And you just never know when it's going to happen. But we know that there are places that are more prone to it. And we can take precautions by putting in best management practices and maintaining them in order to protect human health and the environment. So what do you see in this photo from Olympic National Park in terms of mass wasting? So now that you know a little bit about the environment, rock deformation, you have a better handle on faulting and folding, the things that can cause problems with rock slides, rock falls, rock flows, 
what do you see going on here? When you start looking at geologic places, I want you to start looking with this different pair of eyes that you've been trained to see and interpret those pictures like you're seeing right here with a more educated, cautious view of the environment. We'll see you for the next testing unit, which will be over geysers, thermal features, volcanoes, earthquakes, and tsunamis. So study well for your test number two, and we'll see you in the next unit. Bye.